so good evening and thank you very much for the invitation and kind introduction. Um, actually, I thought I sent you the, the abbreviated version of my CV, so I'm, I'm sorry for the long... I think the, on my phone, the keyboard, <laughs> that's all right. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> of course not, so uh, thank you very much again uh, uh, for the invitation. It's a, it's a re real pleasure to be here. And, the title of the, of the talk uh, today is about the gut-brain axis connecting microbiota and depression. And it sounds a bit uh, uh, actually disconnected because uh, what is happening in, uh, in our guts is, is difficult to imagine that actually uh, affects our behavior. But I will show you some data from uh, animal models and also from some clinical trials. And I hope that by the end of the, of the talk, I will be able to convince you that really this uh, uh, this uh, connection exists. So first we should uh, realize that we are not alone. Uh, so uh, although we are, uh, we think that we, we really dominate the, the world, there are other species and especially these little bugs that were there already for millions uh, of years before us and actually they outnumber us in uh, uh, greatly. So if we really put together all the bacteria living on, uh, on Earth, they are uh, 10 to 30th of bacterial cells, which we can just estimate. If you compare it that there is uh, approximately, I mean, due, during the whole uh, evolution, there was 10 to 10 of humans, and uh, each of us has approximately 10 to 13th of uh, cells, still we are, we are really greatly outnumbered. Now we have to realize that uh, each of us, we have approximately one or two kilograms of bacteria in our, in our bowels, depending what, you, what we eat, how fast the intestinal transit is. And it, it approximates to, approximate to 10 to 14 gut bacteria per uh, individual. So probably we have, uh, there are approximately 10 to 24 uh, intestinal bacteria within the humans. And, when we think about the density of bacteria, when, uh, if we can look at different uh, areas within, uh, uh, within our Earth, the, the densities are actually highest in mammalian intestine. So it would be surprising that there is no communication between the bacteria and, and the host. And it has been actually established already a long time ago that intestinal bacteria are important or are basically the determinants of uh, gut immune function and also the systemic immunity. And during all this evolution, uh, bacteria uh, have developed a mutualistic relationship uh, with the host and it, it really educates and, and shapes the, uh, the immune system uh, throughout our life. During the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, we have also realized that intestinal bacteria, the, the, the good ones, um, serve, uh, they protect us against pathogens, they help to extract certain nutrients from food, they also aid or determine the metabolism of uh, certain diseases, and they up, uh, influence also the absorption and distribution of uh, body fat. So this is just uh, uh, some nice pictures from a uh, review which was published by uh, Dr. McPherson. And here what uh, you can see is just a density of uh, immune cells which are producing uh, uh, immunoglobulins A in the intestine of germ-free mice. To, and this is on the left and the mice that were colonized. And you can see all these dark uh, brown or reddish spots. These are all cells which contain these uh, uh, IgAs, these uh, uh, antibodies. And we can see that also at the bottom that these are uh, CD4 positive lymphocytes, again, one of the important uh, cells uh, in our body. And there is a great difference between uh, the numbers in germ-free mice and uh, normal healthy uh, uh, mice colonized with bacteria. Several years ago, uh, uh, the researchers who are studying uh, cardiovascular health and, and diseases realized that bacteria may be also an important determinant of uh, cardiovascular health. And this is a study which was published several years ago where the author studied a relatively large cohort of patients and uh, tried to uh, relate 
uh, certain food components and, and food metabolites with uh, cardiovascular health. And they were able to identify one compound which is called phosphatidylcholine. This is, a, uh, uh, this is a molecule which is present, for example, in, in red meat, in, uh, in dairy. And it serves uh, uh, as a, as a um, base molecule to produce certain metabolites which are used everywhere in our body. And one of these molecules is actually this trimethylamine anoxide. And this uh, molecule was shown to be a biomarker which actually predicted whether the patients uh, will have problems with stroke or high blood pressure. And what is important that uh, uh, what they showed in the another part of the study, that the way how this uh, 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 phosphatidylcholine, the part of our normal uh, diet is metabolized and how it's processed in our body depend uh, depends on gut bacteria. So if, uh, for example, normal mice were treated with uh, a mixture of antibiotics and then it uh, decreased the amount of bacteria, uh, the, the levels of this trimethylamine oxide also decreased. So obviously there is, there is link uh, to the diet, gut microbiota and our health, and I will speak about it uh, uh, still later. So with respect to, to bacteria, we are learning more and more using molecular approaches. So we know that uh, overall we have uh, between four to 700 uh, strains of bacteria, each of us, and they vary according to our genetic background, according to the environment, and it's mainly the diet which determines the composition of uh, gut bacteria. So uh, approximately five years ago, there was a large European study which determined that there are approximately three main types of uh, uh, these enterotypes which, uh, or microbial profiles in men. And they were basically determined by uh, two groups or three groups of bacteria. One of them was uh, Bacteroides, uh, the second one was a group of Prevotella, and the th uh, third one, Ruminococcus. And it was uh, the next study actually from, uh, uh, from Dr. Wu and his uh, colleagues which actually determined that it's the long-term diet which will determine which kind of uh, enterotype, which kind of bacteria profiles we will have. So uh, the uh, type of uh, type 1, Bacteroides, was mainly associated with uh, protein consumption, so that means, let's say, the meat eaters, while the type 2, Prevotella, was mainly associated with a vegetarian-based diet. So we know that intestinal microbiota is inherited uh, mainly from maternal transmission, that means from, from our mothers, but it also is determined by the long-term and short-term changes in diet. But also there can be other environmental factors which can change it temporarily or even in, in the long term. One of them is, for example, antibiotics. Most of, most of the studies suggest that usually within several weeks or several months our gut microbiota uh, returns to normal uh, levels, uh, comparable to, uh, to before the treatment with antibiotics. But there are some studies that uh, these changes may persist up to several years. And uh, we know that also infections, uh, whether these are viral, um, bacterial, or uh, parasitic infections, can change the composition of gut microbiota. And all these uh, parameters actually can uh, influence each other. So we have to realize that most of the bacteria cannot be cultured, although this, this is uh, being questioned quite recently. But this is, it's generally established that most of the bacteria, we can detect them only by uh, molecular methods. And if you imagine these uh, bacteria living in our gut, uh, it can be like this uh, jar with uh, these uh, different colors of beans. This is a normal microbiota. So what is considered normal is that we have a big variety of, uh, of bacteria. And each of these bacteria, they, they may have a different function which, uh, which they fulfill within the intestine. If there is any infection treatment with antibiotics or let's say stress, this can uh, temporarily change the composition of bacteria and especially reduce the numbers. And the question is whether we are able to fully recover. That means we go back to the, to the left, to the original jar, which is filled of these uh, multicolor uh, uh, um, beans, or whether 
some of these uh, bacterial strains will be basically suppressed or eliminated, and we have the, what is called dysbiosis, so that means altered bacterial profiles. And this is the concept I will come back later uh, during, uh, during my talk. So behavior, anxiety, depression, so is there any clinical data? I mean, data from patients which would suggest that really bacteria can affect uh, our behavior. So there, were, there are several indirect uh, clues. The first one is a study which was uh, published already um, 16, 15 years ago uh, from Germany. And in this study, the authors st um, investigated uh, fermentation profiles in patients with depression. And they found that, this abnormal, that they have abnormal uh, profiles, which would suggest that also the bacteria in their gut uh, uh, are abnormal. There was a recent, there were actually two recent studies in uh, patients with major depression, and I in these studies, the, the molecular profiling uh, of, uh, of bacteria was applied. And again, uh, the authors found uh, that uh, uh, the type of bacteria or the composition of bacteria was different compared to healthy individuals. However, we should keep in mind that this could be just consequence. Usually when, uh, when, we do not feel, when we don't feel well, we are anxious, depressed, sometimes we compensate it with, meat, uh, with uh, meals, or sometimes we, uh, the, the patients have uh, different eating patterns. So this, it's not uh, clear whether this is a cause or a consequence. There were also several studies which showed that patients with uh, autism or different um, uh, disorders within the autism spectrum disorders have uh, abnormal microbiota and that some of these patients actually improved after treatment with antibiotics. And then there is uh, another um, entity which is called hepatic encephalopathy and this is a, um, this is a condition uh, which exists in patients with uh, end-stage liver disease and a liver actually works as a, as a filter, uh, taking away certain metabolites from the circulation. And some of these patients who, in whom the liver function is really altered, they can develop uh, changes in their cognition, in their mental status. And the way how to, we treat this is either with antibiotics or with laxatives, basically washing the, the intestinal contents of these patients. And usually, uh, one can see very quick recovery of their mental status. And, uh, okay, I already uh, mentioned that. So these were basically the, the data which we have uh, from, uh, from humans. So what we can uh, say about these uh, links between bacteria in, and uh, behavior was more studied in animal models. And I will show you some videos. Uh, and the first one is... Uh, this is a, um, what is called bulb sea mouse, a mouse which is uh, usually used uh, for, for our experiments. It's a laboratory strain colonized with uh, regular bacteria. They are very anxious or they are shy. And this is what is called a step-down test. They, the mouse is placed on an elevated platform. And it's, for them, it's, uh, it's a big task just to step down and start exploring uh, the environment. So, uh, basically, it's a, it's a measure of anxiety or measure of uh, exploratory behavior. So, uh, you saw this is a mouse with normal bacteria. Have a look how the same strain of mice, uh, how they behave when they are devoid of bacteria. These are germ-free mice. So, again, the mouse explores, uh, assesses uh, the risk of the environment. But you can see that the germ-free mouse actually is able to, to step down while uh, the, uh, the colonized mice uh, uh, took much longer. So when we, when we uh, compare the groups of colonized versus germ-free mice, we can see that these, uh, the germ-free mice have more tendency to explore. They are more daring compared to mice that are colonized. And there were several studies, especially the, the one from Karolinska University, uh, which show that also brain chemistry is altered in these mice. So this is actually, these are heat maps from different parts of the, the brain. So for example, hippocampus, which is uh, uh, one of the important parts of, of the brain uh, in control of, uh, of behavior. 
And you can see that uh, there are multiple, there is a list of genes which are differentially expressed in SPF mice, which are, these are the colonized mice versus germ-free mice. And some of the genes are increased and some of them are decreased. So the presence of bacteria will not only determine uh, the behavior of these mice, but it's clearly associated with expression of multiple genes uh, in the brain. In our group, uh, we have investigated whether this change in behavior is really caused by uh, presence of multiple bacteria or uh, just simple uh, mm, several group of, of bacteria or even monocolonization, that means colonizing mouse with one single bacteria can actually induce these changes. And uh, the answer is yes. So this was one of the tests where we explored the, uh, ec uh, the exploratory behavior. And you can see that the colonized mice, these SPF mice, have actually less exploratory behavior than germ-free ones. And the same we can obtain in mice uh, that are colonized with uh, eight commensal bacteria, the, the ones which we can find in our bowels, or with one uh, type of bacteria which is called Escherichia coli. So it seems that the exposure to, uh, to bacteria and probably the immune system plays a major role in this can really change behavior uh, in, in long term. So this was just the basic comparison mice with and without bacteria. So what about if we just change the composition of uh, bacteria uh, in mice? And this is a study which we did several years ago. And this pie chart basically shows the composition of bacteria. You remember I told you uh, the uh, the normal uh, bacterial profiles, there is a heterogeneity of, there are multiple different bacteria the, uh, with different colors. So on the left, we can see the composition of bacteria in healthy mice. And after treating them for one week with, uh, uh, with mixture of antibiotics, you can see that this uh, uh, section in blue uh, expanded. And that means that we change the, uh, the proportion of bacteria in the gut and we expanded mainly the group of uh, lactobacilli. And what was very interesting that we observed change in behavior. So you remember these bulbsy, shy mice. So this, is a, this was actually the picture when you type in, uh, in internet shy mouse, uh, shy mouse, this is what comes up. So I am not sure if it's shy, uh, shy or depressed or, or just hiding. Anyway, we measured the step-down latency. This was the test I showed you before when the mice uh, are placed on the elevated platform and we measure how quickly they step down. So uh, the bulb C mice took approximately 240 seconds. Now, when the mice were treated with antibiotics, suddenly they started stepping down within 40 to 50 seconds. And even more surprisingly, we found changes in brain chemistry, so again, here we investigated uh, levels of uh, BDNF, so which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So this is one of the molecules which stimulates growth and connectivity of, of neurons in the brain. And we saw differential effects. So uh, in the upper part, you can see the, the, the levels in amygdala. Amygdala is an important part of the brain which is, uh, which is controlling uh, anxiety, also depression, and, and actually, it's overexpressed or uh, the, the, the activity is increased in patients with uh, anxiety and depression. So what we saw here, the treatment with antibiotics actually decreased level of BDNF in amygdala and on the contrary increased it in hippocampus, which is the another area of the brain which we already discussed earlier. So this clearly showed us that we can change dynamically the, uh, the bacteria in the gut and it also changes the behavior. So then we ask the question, can we determine just uh, by colonizing mice with certain bacteria, can we change their behavioral traits? And for that we, we used the two different types of mice. So on the right you have the bulb C mice, these are the shy mice, and then we selected NIH Swiss mice. So NIH Swiss mice are outbred. They are very active, very daring. So they are on opposite sides of the behavior scale. And what we did first, that uh, we measured the behavior in these normal colonized mice. And you can see that the NIH Swiss mice step down within 20 seconds. The bulb C mice in these experiments around 280 seconds. 
it took them uh, before they stepped from the elevated platform. In the next set of experiments, we derived these mice germ-free. So that means they did not have any bacteria. And then we colonized them with their own bacteria. That means we were just, we wanted to be sure that the, the stage when they were germ-free did not affect uh, behavior later on. Then we took the same NIH Swiss mice, the daring mice, and colonized them uh, uh, from microbiota, from bacteria, from the shy mice. And suddenly, these mice, they took much longer to step down uh, than the original uh, strain. And the same we saw in uh, bulb C mice. So that means in the shy mice that were colonized with daring microbiota were now stepping down faster. Which would suggest that uh, gut bacteria can modulate at least to a certain degree the behavioral traits which are mainly determined by, uh, by genes. So there are multiple ways by which uh, bacteria can communicate with brain. And I have already mentioned one of them, and this is through the immune system. We know if there is inflammation in the intestine, let's say due to pathogenic bacteria, it can lead to production of cytokines, chemokines, and other signaling molecules which can uh, get to the brain, cross a blood-brain barrier, or they can bind to certain nerves which, uh, which supply the gut and they directly communicate with brain. Uh, it's called uh, the vagus nerve. The other possibility is uh, that uh, the bacteria can act on, a, uh, on specialized uh, cells. They are enteroendocrine cells in the gut. And these cells are located in the, in the lining of the gut and upon its stimulation, they, they release a certain uh, signaling molecules. And these signaling molecules, one of them is serotonin, and this is also a neurotransmitter, which is important uh, uh, in the neural system functioning. And uh, interestingly, this uh, molecule was also linked uh, to depression. The next thing we can, we have to realize uh, that bacteria can actually produce neurotransmitters. And this is a, a theory of, uh, of, of Dr. Light uh, from Texas, who thinks that actually we acquired uh, neurotransmitters, actually the signaling molecules, which were already present in bacteria. So we are not unique. We are just using the same signaling systems as uh, bacteria already for millions and millions of, of years. Then there is another possibility. I already mentioned uh, that specific uh, innervation of the gut the vagus nerve or the spinal nerves. And there is a direct communication between the, uh, the brain and the gut. And again, there were some studies performed already uh, several years ago uh, by a group of res uh, researchers in, 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 uh, uh, in Dr. Lai's group, where they infected mice with uh, Campylobacter. So again, this is one of the uh, bad bacteria, which induces inflammation. But what was very interesting that before any significant inflammation was informed, uh, I mean, was developed, the mice already started behaving differently. They started uh, developing anxiety and depressive-like behavior, which would suggest that in some way uh, the neural system can monitor what is happening in the gut lumen and can transmit this information uh, directly to the, to the brain. And we have to keep in mind that this communication is actually bidirectional. So there is signaling coming from the gut to the brain, but on the other hand, there is also signaling from the brain to the gut. And there are um, already several studies uh, which suggest that, for example, uh, during the stressful situation when the stress hormones or molecules uh, are released in the gut, it changes the adherence of the bacteria to the, to the lining of the gut, and also it changes their uh, functions, I mean, the ability to, to produce certain, uh, uh, certain molecules. So, it's, it, as I say, it's a very complex and bidirectional communication. And the, what, what we investigated uh, several years ago was uh, what is uh, the, the, the role of bacteria in stress and in the long-term consequences of stress which, is, uh, which happens uh, in the early life. And um, probably you may know that uh, uh, there are some uh, studies which suggest that many patients with anxiety and depression had actually some early life stress 
as a trigger uh, of, of, of that disorder later uh, in life. So again, we use some animal models, and this is uh, a model which is well established in, in uh, uh, psychiatry research. Um, it's called um, maternal separation. It's early life stress when newborn pups are separated from their moms uh, for a period of two or three hours per day uh, for, for two weeks. And in adulthood, these mice uh, uh, show anxiety and uh, depressive-like behavior. They have also some abnormalities within their, their gut function. So we did uh, these uh, studies um, in mice which, uh, that were colonized with uh, regular uh, bacteria, and we just confirmed what has been previously known. However, we also performed these uh, experiments in germ-free animals. And to our surprise, there was no difference between the mice that were maternally separated, that means they were stressed, and the control mice. So it would suggest that really bacteria are part of the equation. They are needed actually for the development of this abnormal behavior. So what we did next was to, to take these uh, uh, germ-free mice that were either uh, living in control conditions or were stressed after, after they were born, and we colonized them with healthy regular uh, microbiota from a healthy adult mouse. And what was interesting that within three to four weeks, the bacterial profiles started changing. So there was suddenly a different set of microbiota in, in control mice, and they were very similar to the regular healthy mice we had. The mice that were maternally stressed, they are separated, they developed a different microbiota profile. And what you are seeing here is what is called principal component analysis. And this is actually putting all the information together we have. So that about the number, type of bacteria, and uh, uh, the proximity to each other. And you can see that these uh, samples from mice with that were maternally separated in red cluster different from the controls in blue. Even more surprisingly, when we examined uh, the metabolomic profile, that means the molecules that uh, bacteria are able to produce, we found that they were different. And especially we found uh, several molecules like glutamate, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and these are all molecules which are previously, um, they were previously reported to, to affect behavior. So what we then measured, of course, was the behavior. And to our surprise, only the mice that were previously maternally separated and they have now abnormal microbiota profiles developed the anxiety and depression-like behavior compared to those uh, that were raised as uh, control animals. So what we now think, uh, what, what, is, uh, what was happening in that specific model, that when, uh, when we stress uh, mice at the early age, when the neural system is uh, very uh, plastic, we can induce uh, some long-term changes in their stress uh, reactivity. There may be direct action on the nerves within the gut, and this will probably change the composition of bacteria and uh, metabolic activity of these, uh, uh, of these bacteria. And these molecules then can affect or, or determine the behavior of, of the host. So uh, if we now, we, so far we were speaking about the, the bacteria, what happens with the, let's say, comments of this regular bacteria. I would like now to speak about uh, probiotics. And probiotics, I mean, you, you can go to, to store by different uh, probiotics, lactobacilli, bifidobacteria. They are very popular. And when you, when you read about the definitions, it should be a living microorganism that confer a health benefit to the host when administered in adequate amounts. So probiotics are now used for uh, gut symptoms, for just feeling better. So we started actually uh, investigating the effect uh, on, on, uh, on behavior. And this was based on the previous studies which show that uh, certain uh, probiotic bacteria can have immunomodulatory effects. So that means they interact with the lining of the gut. They can also change the, the proportion of bacteria in, in the gut, especially in the, in the, uh, in the large bowel. And they can also modulate the permeability of, of the gut. So that means 
a, a leaky gut theoretically can be repaired by uh, administration of, uh, of probiotics. And there is also some data that uh, bacteria can change mucus production. So there are specialized cells uh, in, in the bowel which are producing mucus and the mucus basically stays on top of the, the epithelium and it, it creates an additional barrier for, for bacteria uh, actually to, to cross the lining of the gut. And I have already uh, was discussing this uh, effect on metabolism. So we have used another model uh, in mice and this was uh, uh, based on known effects of uh, uh, pathogens. This was actually um, uh, infection with, uh, uh, with a parasite which uh, resides in the large bowel and uh, this specific uh, parasite uh, induces uh, low-grade inflammation and this low-grade inflammation probably through the production of different inflammatory mediators can change behavior and in this specific model, we, were, we induced anxiety-like behavior and we also, we also induced changes, actually decrease the level of this uh, neurotrophin, uh, we already discussed it, BDNF, in the hippocampus. And we tried different probiotics, whether we would be able to change the inflammation in the gut and consequently change also the, the behavior. We tried uh, one of the probiotics, which is called Lactobacillus rhamnosus. It did not have any effect. But one of the probiotics we, we tried was uh, uh, called Bifidobacterium longum. To our surprise, it completely normalized the behavior. It normalized the levels of uh, BDNF in the, in the brain. However, it was not changing the, the inflammation in the gut. If anything, the inflammation in the gut got worse. So definitely the beneficial effect was not through the immune system, but maybe there was some uh, direct effect on the on the neurons. And we uh, studied it further in an in, a in vitro model where we studied the excitability of the nerves in the gut and you know, one can uh, measure the, the spontaneous activity of, of neurons if you incubate them in Krebs, which is a control medium, or in MRS. And MRS is a culture medium uh, which we use to, to grow this probiotic. And you can see that these two media actually were comparable with respect uh, to their effect on this excitability of the neurons. However, when we incubated these neurons and measured their activity after uh, incubating them with uh, supernatum from this probiotic, we found that the activity of the nurse significantly decreased. So maybe there is really some uh, metabolite which this uh, probiotic uh, secretes and is able to, to modulate uh, uh, the activity of, of the nervous system. So I would like to, to show you very, very briefly a result of a clinical study because based on this uh, very uh, exciting and promising results in animal models, once, uh, once, uh, one wants to know whether this really works in, in humans. And we did a, a clinical trial in patients with irritable bowel syndrome and um, uh, concurrent anxiety or depression. And again, this is, it is very, known, very well known that patients with uh, irritable bowel syndrome have frequent uh, depression or anxiety. And probably these are these two conditions which potentiate e each other. So um, we used a, a probiotic. I, I cannot disclose the, the name of it because the study has not been uh, published yet. But uh, we treated uh, the patients for a period of six weeks with a specific probiotic or with placebo. And uh, we measured the proportion of patients that improved with uh, one or the other treatment. And you can see here on the left that after the six weeks of uh, treatment, a uh, majority of patients uh, treated with this probiotic improved their depression compared to, uh, to patients that were treated only with placebo. And surprisingly, this beneficial effect was uh, present even one month after. We did also uh, functional brain imaging. And again, this is using uh, magnetic resonance imaging. The patients are being shown certain uh, uh, images, either sad faces, happy faces, scary faces, and then we can record uh, uh, the activity uh, within certain uh, brain areas. And I will tr just try to make it simple. So 
Uh, these are images of, of the brain. And um, the areas which will light up in orange or yellow, these are the areas which are more active in the patients who were treated uh, with placebo. The areas which light up in blue are the, the one that were active uh, in patients treated with probiotic. So before the treatment, when we compare these two groups, whether there is any difference at the at baseline, we saw only mild increase in the uh, group of patients who were then treated with uh, probiotic. And this was in the areas of the, of the brain which are related to, uh, uh, to attention and to uh, uh, visual stimuli. However, after treatment, we found that there was a big difference in multiple brain areas, including amygdala, hippocampus, and interestingly, these areas were more active in patients who were treated with uh, placebo, which, will, which would suggest that the, the probiotic treatment actually decreased the activity or in multiple brain areas in, in that specific dro uh, group. So um, I, will, I will be finishing. So this is uh, just my uh, take home message. Uh, Gut microbiota plays a crucial role uh, in the development of uh, host physiology, including immunity and metabolism. And it is probably one of the significant determinants of health or disease. Its composition is uh, maternally transmitted, but it's shaped by long-term diet and environment. And it's actually altered in many chronic diseases uh, from the psychiatric diseases, it's autism and uh, major depression. We have some data, uh, especially from animal models, which suggest that changing microbiota composition can change the behavior, but also brain, uh, brain chemistry and, and genes that are expressed in the brain. And now we have also data, both from animal studies and from humans, to suggest that treatment with specific probiotics can normalize the abnormal behavior and brain chemistry. And as I said, this can apply also for, uh, for humans. So at the end, I would like to acknowledge all the people who were involved in these studies. And actually, the, uh, what I presented, this is work of, of last 12 years. And, and so some people I would like to mention is Jada de Palma and Ines Pinto Sanchez, who were doing the animal and uh, uh, the human studies. And you cannot do it alone. You need a collaboration with uh, multiple institutions within McMaster or, or outside. I would mention Jeffrey Hall, who was uh, doing actually all the, the brain imaging, and support also uh, from, uh, from pharmaceutical, or let's say nutraceutical industry. We have a long-term collaboration uh, uh, with Nestle Switzerland. And I would like also to acknowledge all the funding agencies uh, that supported this, uh, this project. So thank you for your attention.